Mic check. Testing, testing. Check, check, audio. Check, Mike, check. Audio check. Okay. Audio check. Audio check. See, Good copy. Mr. Chairman, we are live in five, four, three, two, one. Good morning, and uh, <laughs> welcome to the uh, June 28th, 2023 meeting of the Utah Board of Oil, Gas, and Mining. Uh, 
as normal, we will be starting uh, this morning's session with a, a briefing from the Division of Oil, Gas, and Mining, and so I will turn the time over to you, Director Baza. Huh? Thank you, Chairman Borden, and welcome to you and members of the board for your June meeting here in Salt Lake City. I am John Baza. I'm the Director of the Division of Oil, Gas, and Mining, and we'd like to take the next few minutes giving you a briefing on key issues that uh, we've been addressing in the division. Um, before I start the actual presentation on item number one, I'd like to uh, introduce a couple of people that uh, I think you'll, you'll see more of as time goes by. And it relates to a program that I'm a big fan of. It is the O'Hara Fellowship Program within the Attorney General's Office, and what it is, it is a, a basically a financial assistance program for people who are in law school at the University of Utah. There's an application process, and uh, um, the AG's office supports those worthy individuals uh, during their, between their first and second year of law school. They come work for the AG's office as clerks, and then between their second and third year, they do something similar. And then after they graduate from law school, they have a commitment of two years with the AG's office. And uh, you've all known Maddie for a while. Maddie is finishing her first year as an O'Hara Fellow and will be uh, transitioning to her second year very soon. And we're looking forward to that. They get a chance to, uh, to bounce around the department a little bit and see how state government works and to do legal work for the AG's office for various divisions. In fact, one of the attorneys that will be representing the division today um, is sitting in the back of the room, Charles Lyon. And Charles uh, was an O'Hara fellow and is now full-time with the AG's office, but is assigned to the wildlife division. So uh, he's helping us out today since Liz is out of town. So wanted to uh, introduce a couple of individuals who are in that transition of doing summer work for the AG's office. The, the first is Carter Moore. Carter. Um, he is the newest O'Hara fellow at the AG's office. Carter is here for the summer and he'll return to law school and he'll be graduating from the University of Utah Law School in May. And then he'll be back with the AG's office for at least two years. Carter is originally from Kansas City, Missouri and graduated from Utah State before working as a river guide and starting law school. The second one I'd like to introduce to you is Nico Micheletti. And Nico is a Dusnip Fellow with the AG's office. He'll be in his second year of law school at the university come August. Um, Nico graduated from Montana State and worked as a roadkill cleaner for a few years. He is not afraid to get involved in the grizzly stuff. So anyway, I just wanted to introduce those two to you and know that you'll be seeing them in the future from time to time, so welcome. I'll move on to our the first item on our briefing agenda, which is a follow-up to a presentation that the division gave to the uh, Interim Committee, Natural Resources Interim Committee of the Legislature this past month. And I won't go through all of the slides, um, but we had about a 20-minute presentation uh, Chairman Borden was there, Mike was there, Maddie was there. Um, they all observed what was going on. We were concerned because there might have been some questions come up about vested mining rights, which was a function of House Bill 527 from last year. That bill was introduced, um, discussed. It did not pass through the legislature, but this subject was an item we asked for on the interim study agenda so that uh, we could address some of the concerns raised during that. Because 527, the good part was it was going to 
give us some changes to Title 40 that would have improved the mine permitting process for minerals. But it also was trying to address some concerns by certain mine operators about county authority and jurisdiction. And so it was also making changes to Title 17, which was something we were somewhat opposed to. And we wanted to make sure that, uh, that if there are questions about how the two um, connected with each other, that we had certain people who could represent the board at that meeting as well. So again, I'm not going to jump through all of this. Uh, I will go to the parts that I think are per relevant. But I was up there along with Deputy Director Dana Dean and um, Assistant AG Liz Harris. Um, they did the bulk of the presentation. I just introduced them to the committee and uh, tried to indicate that this was an item important to the division. Um, but they did the, the lion's share of the work in both preparing the presentation and giving it up on the hill. Um, first few slides just talk generally about the division, our mission, the, the nature of the minerals program, um, and Dana did all of this, and it transitioned into talking about, well, what are the mining permits issued by the minerals program? And there are three of them. There is exploration permitting, there is small mining operation, which is designed for anything less than 10 or 20 acres, depending on whether you're in an incorporated area of the state, and then large mining operations for those things that exceed the small mine limits. Um, we, Dana talked about the active permits in the state and how many there are, how many are in exploration, small mining and large mining, and the fact that we hold over $418 million in bonds for reclamation. So then Liz took over and talked about specifically what we were asking the legislature to consider. And we uh, boiled it down to three different items. We wanted to be able to clarify the application requirements for the different permit types. And I'll explain that more in just a minute. We wanted to clarify OGM's role in the permitting process because that became very convoluted and involved this last year with a couple of mining operations that were applying for activity. And then we wanted to clarify the process for public participation. So real simply, we boiled it down to the, the first item was internal to the division's process. The second item was, you know, what is the division's role in this process and clarifying that for the operators themselves so they would know what to expect. And then the third item was really to clarify to the public, this is how you should interact with the divisions, division on these items. So the first item was clarifying our permit requirements. This is the part of the statute that talks about mine permitting. It's a page and a half of code and it mixes exploration, small mining, and large mining together. And we feel that it's important to address each type of permit separately so people will, operators will understand if you're applying for an exploration permit, these are the requirements. Small mining, similarly. Large mining, these are the requirements. So that's what we would hope to do uh, with some of these things we're asking the legislature for. The second was to clarify the division's role, um, because right now there's some inconsistent language in the permitting statute. It's unclear whether the division can impose conditions on small mine permits to protect public health and safety. Even though it says that in the statute, it doesn't say how we're supposed to do that, or whether if there's overlap between us and DEQ, how those things are resolved. Um, under the current statute, it's interesting that the division is not allowed to deny a permit application, even if technically deficient. We can go back to the operator and keep asking for better information, 
but eventually the process is designed so that we approve it at some point. It may take a long time, but that's what the process is supposed to end up being. Um, so we're seeking to clarify that the division has the authority to approve, deny, ask for modifications if necessary, and impose reasonable conditions to ensure public health and safety. And then the last request was to clarify the public participation process. The current system is pretty frustrating um, and it, we want to move the public comment period for large mines to the beginning of the permit process. Right now it's designed so that when a notice of intent is filed um, and the division goes through the analysis, at the end of that process, we publish a tentative approval and then that's when a public comment period begins. And it's been difficult for the public because they think, oh, you're having a public comment, but you guys have already decided what you want to do with this. And we do that public comment really to bring out issues that maybe the division hasn't considered that should be included in the review. So we'd like to move that public comment process to the beginning of the review that way the public can weigh in and say, these are concerns we have that are specific to this mine. Um, we'd like you to consider those during the review process. And we'd also like to clarify who can intervene and appeal a permit decision. Right now it's very unclear. And the same thing with small mines. We wanna clarify what are the public notice requirements because right now there aren't any for small mines. Um, it just, is submitted to the division and the division is expected to review it and approve it according to certain standards and off you go. So that was basically the presentation. I, I will offer the chance for Chairman Borden or Mike or Maddie to weigh in with any, uh, any opinions they had about the presentation or the comments received from the legislature. But, it's my understanding at this point that the legislature is going to stand up a work group. It'll obviously include the division and maybe some other parties. Um, we don't know specifically yet what that work group will look like, but we heard a rumor from one of the company lobbyists that they've already selected uh, kind of a chair for that committee um, and that we should be hearing from them very soon. Thank you, Director Baza. I, uh, I guess my observations from being there that I thought uh, the presentation was very well received by the legislature, or, uh, or at least the people on that committee. Um, obviously, during this period when the sausage is actually being made, uh, we'll need to stay engaged as much as possible to make sure unwanted things don't creep into uh, the process, uh, if possible. Huh? I agree. Any questions or comments from the board? Um, I, I guess a quick question is, is so, uh, maybe a dumb question, how does this affect with rulemaking and such? Well, normally rulemaking follows statutory change. Statutory, okay. So it's the statutory, there's different ways it can happen. The statute can actually say this item needs rulemaking and they assign it to the Board of Oil, Gas, and Mining to do that. Or it could be that the, the statute is very clear and doesn't need any rulemaking, then we wouldn't have to do it. So we'll have to analyze the verbiage of the statute when it's finally passed. And if, if it requires rulemaking, we'll certainly bring that back to the board and, and request your involvement at that point. Back to you, Mr. Baza, I guess. So. Okay. Well, that concludes our first item, so I'll get out of this. So the second item on the agenda is um, we belong to a group of, with a group of member states to the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission. They hold two meetings a year. One is called their annual business meeting, which they've generally conducted at the headquarters city, which is uh, Oklahoma City. Um, this year, I was not able to attend that, and 
So Bart Kettle, the deputy director over oil and gas, did attend and went to all of the uh, business meetings. So I'd like Bart to take time and, and report on, on what he learned at that meeting. Thank you, Director Baza. So um, as John previously stated, the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission is a, it's, it's a multi-state agency that's viewed as authority on domestic oil and gas issues. Um, and in attendance at this meeting is a lot of, of the directors or leadership for various oil and gas state regulatory programs. And I just wanted to talk about a couple of things that I really took away from the conversation. That was a couple days, and so of course there was lots of conversations in there. I'm just gonna hit a, a few highlights uh, that are pertinent to us. So one of the things that was a big topic of conversation was of course geologic carbon sequestration. And as some of you may recall, we had a statute change recently in the state that directs our division to go seek primacy from the EPA for geologic carbon sequestration. We're currently working towards uh, selecting some third parties to help us complete that primacy application here in the near future. Um, a second item that was discussed very heavily at this annual business meeting was actually the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, commonly referred to as IIJA, and specifically orphan well plugging was the topic that everybody was interested in talking about. Um, and just for the boards, kind of as a, a, a memory refresher, there's states out there with tens of thousands of orphan wells. We've been very fortunate here in Utah where we sit with less than 50 orphan wells in the state. And, and I just kind of want to bring that back to the attention of the board of we don't feel that that's an accident. That's some 30 years of active management. Now, of course, we have to continue that process. Um, and part of what has helped us with orphan well uh, management over time is we have two parts. We have an idle well rule that sets out how idle wells are managed over time. And uh, then, of course, we have financial assurance involved with that. Um, and the two rules combined when administered very actively as we've done over time have proven to be reasonably effective. Sorry, I keep coming in and out on this microphone. Um, and I just kind of want to segue into financial assurance. As the board knows, we're in rulemaking for a bonding rule in this exact moment. Um, in fact, we have a stakeholder engagement meeting this Friday. Uh, we think there's a chance to do kind of some innovative stuff in how we approach financial assurance going forward and maybe solidify some of the things that we've done well and then also strengthen a few weaknesses we see. So we look forward to bringing a rule to the, to the board for recommendation here in the near future. Um, another item that was a huge topic was uh, retention and recruitment. Um, it's been a, a news item across the U.S. for a while. It's something I think we've all probably heard of at this point. But one of the things I realized from this meeting is while we are affected by this, our division experienced 20% turnover last year. Um, it feels like we should probably expect something similar in this upcoming year. We're far better off than many of our peers. Uh, many of them were reporting vacancies in the range of 40% of their staff, which would just be devastating. Uh, for any organization to be at that level. And so I just kind of wanted to say, yes, it is an issue for us, but we fared a little better. And also maybe take a moment and um, give a hats off to the staff, because we, we're, we're an organization that's knowledge-based. They're the ones that help us get there. And we've been very fortunate. We've got some of what I think are some of the best people there are in our staff and, and continue to get a few uh, really good people to add to our organization as time goes on. It also signifies, though, the importance of, of succession planning. Sorry, I don't know if this is coming in and out for you guys. It is for me. Um, but it signifies the importance of succession planning where um, as uh, turnover continues to be an issue. Anyway, as... Uh, as turnover appears to continue to be an issue going forward for multiple organizations, we'll have to be very purposeful in how we approach succession planning. I think I've uh, kind of presented to the board and the oil and gas program in 2017. Uh, this date is a little bit old, but in 2017, we averaged over 15 years of experience with the agency. That number shrunk to eight years now. 
And it probably feels like that's somewhat the future. So succession planning is gonna be a really important thing for us as we move forward. Um, and then one other thing that got a lot of conversation was outreach um, for the various agencies. And I kinda, of course we're struggling with all the various outreach items that we'd like to do or wish we'd do, but I did wanna kinda point out one thing to the board where uh, we've done very good with outreach and it's something that each of you participate in each month and that is this very meeting um, being broadcast live. We've got a great AV staff that kind of supports us, helps pull all that off and it's something that's just not present in every state and so you know that's one of kind of the innovations and in outreach that we were on the forefront and, and I just kind of wanted to point that out and then also maybe give the AV crew a little like thanks for the great work they do to prepare us and that's all I have unless there's questions. Any questions? Board? Seeing none, thank you very much. I would point out to you that there is a uh, IOGCC meeting where all the other states will be coming to Utah this fall. And it's, um, the schedule is I think October 18th through the 20th, should be a Monday through Wednesday. And it's going to be up at Deer Valley. So um, we're happy to register board members for that meeting. If you're interested in attending, it'll be all oil and gas all the time. So if you have an interest in doing that, please let me or let Julianne know and we'll figure out how to get you registered. Thank you. So those are the main two briefing items we had. Um, there are some other items I wanted to bring up with you. One involves some department level planning efforts that are going on right now. We always go through a, a budget process that begins at this time of the year. In fact, um, we are developing our budget requests and trying to consolidate those for the fiscal year 25 fiscal year, so um, we'll go through the process this fall, uh, we'll get departmental approval if we submit specific building blocks to the governor's office. The governor's office generally reviews those and then the governor puts out a budget in December and that budget is then considered by the legislature uh, during their coming session in January of 2024 and that will be for the fiscal year that begins in July 1 of 2024. So we refer to it as our fiscal year 25. So you can see the planning effort has to begin nearly two years out for whatever we're going to be doing in that budget year. Um, it, it, it's even tougher if you're in the federal government, so thank goodness I'm not. But uh, our, our pre-planning has to happen very soon in order to get our requests in. Um, as part of that, the department is also engaged in a strategic planning effort that involves all of the divisions in the department. And they had asked us to work on our strategic plans and submit those to the department this last month. And then the department will roll that up somehow into a department strategic plan which I believe is gonna come out next week, if I'm not mistaken. It'll be uh, posted sometime in the next few days. But um, that strategic plan is something that the governor's office ex is expecting us to follow when we submit these budget increase requests. We refer to them as building blocks. And so all of our building blocks have to tie to our strategic plan in some way or another. Um, we would be happy to do a briefing at some point and provide the board with the details of what we've developed for the division's strategic plan through our managers. Um, and it's certainly a living, breathing document and it can change at any time, but it takes a snapshot right now and says, these are the things we think are important to pursue and um, guides us 
and how we will conduct business for the next immediate future. Any questions on that? Would that strategic plan be appropriate to, to present at, at one of the briefing sessions, one of the, the board hearing? Meetings? I don't see why not. As long as we've, as the department is going live with theirs, I would assume that our strategic plan would be a public document at that point as well. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Baza? Yes. Uh, when that is, I assume that's going to be a public document? Is that going to be a public document? Well, or? the fact is, Ms. Garrison, any document we prepare is probably a public <laughs> probably, document. Probably, probably. So, would, um, would, when it comes out, would you just maybe link the board members to it so we could read it ourselves also? Sure, sure. And it would maybe be nice to have a presentation to the board. Absolutely. Uh, the other question I have for you, what has happened with our suggestions for electronic participation? Are you using those now or are they in discussion still? Not yet. It kind of fell through the cracks this last okay. month. We did get your feedback that said they were adequate. And so we've got to take, make the effort now of distributing those to the practitioners and parties so that they know well, how, how to conduct their remote participation. Will you be sure Mr. McDonald gets a copy of that? <laughs> I will. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, any questions? Any further questions? Okay. Uh, the second thing I wanted to bring up is um, the vision each month conducts a staff seminar. We do it in person as much as possible, but we also uh, have it on Google Meetings so that other staff who may be busy or unavailable that day can connect if they want to. Uh, we also record those. So this last month, um, our staff seminar was uh, Travis Gray, who presented. Uh, I think you saw him on the field trip. He talked about the, the well blowout in Grand County that he was participating in. Well, he made that same presentation to all of the division staff during our staff seminar. But it was suggested, and I, I think it's a good idea, that we include board members in those invitations for the staff seminar. If you have time and you want to watch, it'll give you a good overview of the work that's being conducted in the division. Because we cycle through the programs. This last month, it was oil and gas. This next month, um, it will likely be AMR, um, and we kind of walk through that. There are a couple of months where we don't have seminars because we have other uh, full staff activities that are planned, but if, if, if you would like, and I'm offering this to you, we will include you on the invitation list to attend those virtually if you want, or if you happen to be in town and you want to drop by and attend one in person, you're welcome to do that too. I I think I could speak for the whole board saying we would be interested in that. Um, I don't think we could guarantee attendance all the time, but a topic that is of particular interest, I'd, I'd certainly enjoy that. Yeah, it's entirely optional to you. So we'll make sure you get those invitations. Is it typically at the same time, uh, you know? Yeah, in fact, regularly? I think we've tried to do it generally on the third Thursdays, um, usually two to three in the afternoon. Sometimes that has to change depending on meeting room availability, but um, you know, we'll, we'll make sure you get plenty of notice when, when the dates and times are. Any other questions on that? And then the last thing I'll bring up under other items is, and this kind of is part of the uh, next month's agenda as well. Um, on July 13th, we'll have our next Uinta Basin Oil and Gas Collaborative Meeting. And we're doing, uh, we're sponsoring a lunch this time. So it, uh, it'll be a meeting from nine to 12 in the morning with a lunch immediately following. It has become quite a noteworthy activity. I mean, a lot of people are attending now. And I remember the early days of this back in the 
2001-2002 time frame when we were lucky to get half a dozen people to come to one of these meetings. Now we probably get 120 people in person and maybe another 50 to 60 online who are watching. So it, it's, it's an event that we do quarterly and board members are welcome to attend. Um, I generally travel out to Duchesne the night before so that uh, we can get up early the next morning and get the meeting room ready. Um, we always do it at the Duchesne City Events Center. And uh, some of you have been there or met there in the past. But we're doing that again on July 13th. So if you're interested in attending, let me know. If you want to observe it online, we can get the link to you. Um, anything you want to do with that. Just giving you that reminder. Thanks. Any questions, comments on that? All right. Thank you very much. Well, Mr. Chairman and board members, that really concludes my presentation for this morning. And uh, I'll turn the time back to you for any other business you have this morning. Thank you, Director Baza. Uh, now's the time where uh, the public has an opportunity to comment. If if there is anybody that would like to make a comment uh, today, please step forward to the microphone and state your name, and uh, we'd love to hear from you. Huh? Seeing none, um, we will adjourn until 10 o'clock, and then we will be reconvening then and starting the uh, first of the board hearing matters. Thank you very much.